Hello and welcome to Contra Mundum. I'm your host, Pastor Andrew Isker, and with me is my co-host, CJ Engel. Hello, CJ. How's your week? My week was good. I didn't make it to the post office to ship you the gum. And by the way, Andrew, I uh, I was I I think um, Greco Gum sent a pack to to Pete over here, and he just he just didn't get it. He just I, I didn't get it. it. At all. I, <laughs> oh. I, I'm like, I, I, I have no idea what's going on here. And um, wait, so I, you I, really I, did send one to Pete, not me? No, I didn't send it. No, no, <laughs> I didn't send it. No, no. Yeah, and, he, but I did the um, I they sent me two. I sent the one back that had uh, that wasn't used. So. Yeah, I wasn't gonna. I just, I, I mean, I'm just like, no, I'm too, I'm too old for this. <laughs> it's, it's a, it's an, it's a, it's a, it's a cult. It's a cult beat, and if you, you're not, you can't get in. You know, it's. I guess. It's yeah, yeah, I guess. Well, well, well uh, with that, I'd like. I, to there's a lot yourself. of clubs that have not let me in in my life, <laughs> and yeah, I, I've never looked back and been like, yeah. damn, I really wish they would have let me in. You'll well, see, like Greco gum nationalism. You'll, you'll. you'll uh, <laughs> You'll regret this. Yes. Well, uh, with that, I, I need to introduce our uh, special guest for this episode, uh, Pete Canones. Uh, thank you for joining us here today, Pete. Uh, Pete has uh, an unbelievable uh, podcast and, and YouTube channel, and and well, I guess it's it's more than a YouTube channel because they keep you know kicking you out and, yeah. and that kind of thing. But uh, Odyssey, uh, Rumble. Odyssey, Rumble, all, all of that. Um, uh, online online content. Pro producer, creator, uh, whatever we want to call call that you know that thing, uh, but his his content is out of this world. Uh, I think this eclectic group of of guests that he brings on that are are top notch, really brilliant guys, um, really some of the some of the uh, best ideas uh, out there um, that you that you're going to get. I mean, they cover a wide range of topics, but I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself a little bit more, Pete. What your show's about, what you guys cover and do uh you know what you're all about here so go go ahead well it started off as a a basic libertarian anarcho-capitalist podcast and like many libertarians and anarcho-capitalists we find out that 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 pipeline that they talk about is very much real mm -hmm. where, where you're yeah. you pipeline out of libertarianism when you uh once you see oh People are locking themselves down yeah. voluntarily. You mean they're not rioting? Oh, no, they're rioting during the summer. <laughs> and the that. police are standing down and politicians are bailing them out of jail and they're killing people in the streets. Oh, and then there was this election thing that happened. And yeah, that was if this is going on YouTube, I won't. Yeah. Get it. Yeah. <laughs> it was fortified. It was, yeah, it was fortified. very fortified. <laughs> and then a bunch of people decided to protest it by walking around and acting like idiots. And all of a sudden, 30 percent of the population is calling them insurrectionists, even though there were like no guns or nothing. Yeah. And I'm like, people are retarded and <laughs> people are people aren't only retarded. They're spiritually they're spiritually retarded. Yeah. And <laughs> D this. Democracy is a uh, government yeah. of the retarded by the retarded and for the retarded. Yes. I mean, it is, to, <laughs> to believe that the the that any other way besides like getting your own friends and people who share your values in charge is going to change anything for the better for you is kind of insane. You're not going to, you know, Donald Trump got elected. He got elected saying he was going to drain the swamp and he immediately hired the swamp. Yeah. And you found out that he wasn't going to cross the Rubicon. Yeah. And if the same thing will happen with DeSantis and the same thing will happen with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. If he gets elected, mm -hmm. nothing is going, nothing is going to change um, at the national level until a, a group of elites get serious about making it change. And yeah. then when you, you know, when you have elites uh, making change, you have to ask, well, why are they doing that? And you just have to hope that you're, you line up um, ideologically enough with them so that it's palatable to you. Because yeah. I've come to the conclusion that most governance is just not going to be palatable. No, mm -hmm. no, not, not in this age, not, not, not with all of the um, features of the modern world, uh, we could call them. Uh, yeah, it's it just it's 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 not going to be. It's not you're not going to have any type of governance, any type of rule or authority right now, 
that is beneficial to our people. Like I, the way I describe, you know, like CJ and I both, we, we talk about this on the show a lot that, you know, 10 years ago, we were, we were these and cap Rothbardian uh, libertarians, you know, we were into the Ron Paul thing and all of that. And, and we all, you know, we, and all of our friends, you know, independently, you know, we didn't even, we kind of, we kind of strayed from libertarianism, you know, sheepishly. Like we were, we, we weren't talking about it amongst ourselves. We're like, yeah, first it's an embarrassment, you know? Yeah. And then it's, and then it's an object of scorn. Yeah. Yeah. And we were, we, I remember we were in the same group chat with a bunch of uh, buddies and in a, you know, Facebook group that were administering this Facebook, this large Facebook group. And one day we just all said, Hey, I don't think I'm a libertarian anymore. And, uh, when you kind of like reveal yourself to the group, right. But I don't think I am anymore. And that, that everybody else was like, yeah, I mean, either <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, it's totally cringe. It doesn't make any sense. It, it, it's, it's this, you know, really oblivious, aloof view of the world. Once you, once you start to you know see the things that you're talking about, um, you realize this is this is not going to happen. People don't yearn for freedom. They don't want freedom. They want to be ruled. Most people do. They want they want this you know big daddy to tell them what to do. Um, and and so there's a very small subset of people that that really do want to govern their own affairs and all of all of that all of that. But that's not the majority, and that's not what we see in America today. And so when you re- make you know get to this realization boy, it, it like, it shatters your world. It shakes you up quite a bit. And then you start looking all sorts of places. Like last week we had uh, Paul Gottfried on and he was, you know, certainly a a huge uh, pillar as far as, you know, intellectually coming out of that world and, and embracing reality. Um, But uh, yeah, I guess, you know, so we, we, all three of us, I think have been on a similar journey um, as, as far as, as libertarianism goes and and it's also kind of within the context of uh, definitely for, for us here, you know, in the context of the Christian faith, there's some kind of synthesis that we, we saw like, well, you could be a Christian and be a libertarian. Here's how it works. Here's how it fits. And here's how, you know, uh, you uh, can't, it's, it's, uh, it's antithetical, yeah. but now, but yeah, now it's like, no, no, you actually can't, <laughs> you can't, it doesn't work. You have to have like God built a world with power and authority with, with, uh, human beings ruling other human beings, um, even at the family level, like you have mothers and fathers who rule the family and you just extrapolate that to the rest of the world. Like that's how, that's how God built it. And you see it everywhere. This is, this is the way people are. And that's, and that's, that's not a bad thing. It's a feature of the world. It's a, it's a good thing. It, it, it can be, I mean, it can be a horribly monstrous evil. Um, but yeah, I guess, so you, so you had the podcast and it was, it was, you know, very anarcho libertarian and, and, you know, Austrian economics and all that, all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, you have this shift that we all did and now, you know, now, now what, what are you? <laughs> That's the question I always get. Well, what are you now, Andrew? Uh, I don't know. I, I'm, <laughs> it's, I, I'm, you know, I, I wrote an article that I've been working on for a while and I, I've shown it to some people and they're like, it needs work, it needs work. <laughs> and, you know, and normally I write articles, I send them to people and they're like, all right, perfect, bang, we'll, we'll put it there. And for some reason, this one is like, people are like, eh, eh. Um, <laughs> and it's just basically my explanation that you're not going to get the perfect ideology you want. Ideology comes in a box. Mm-hmm. Once that, bo- that box is, as uh, Sam Francis said, it's created outside of reality, it gets introduced into reality, gets punched in the mouth, and then it doesn't, you know, it, everything changes. Yeah. So the way I look at it is you look at your immediate environment, figure mm-hmm. out what kind of preferences you would like to see um, as far as your polity goes, as far as your government goes, as far as your, um, you know, your immediate area and you use power to institute that. So basically if you say you have a very small goal of getting rid of property taxes, um, de the schools, mm-hmm. and let's just concentrate on those two. Mm-hmm. That's all you focus on. That's all that, that's, that's what you go for. And while you're doing that, you're making sure you're seeing if anything's creeping in the side door um, mm-hmm. into other issues. But yeah, I mean, I think it's just power and preferences now. Mm-hmm. Not the, and the problem with libertarians is, you know, you have a libertarian governor, somebody who ran for governor uh, 
under the libertarian ticket in Georgia last year who said that if he got elected, he would destroy power. <laughs> well, I mean, that's like saying if I get elected, I'm going to, you know, blow up the world to the point where there's no atom, there's not one atom left. Well, yeah. that's an impossibility. You're not power voids are filled. Um, mm -hmm. You can choose not to use as much power as you would uh, normally, but you know, power voids are going to be filled. So um, <laughs> the way I look at it is libertarians eschew power. They think mm -hmm. that it, they're going to use persuasion and persuasion only works under the, you know, under the threat of force, yeah. mm -hmm. not violence. Yeah. You know, that's one thing I learned from Curtis Yarvin is there's a difference between violence and force. Yeah. Force is putting your thumb on somebody. It might have to come to violence at some point. You don't want that to happen because that that increases the chance for chaos to grow. Yeah. But putting being able being willing to put your thumb on somebody so that you can get your way is exactly what politics is. And if you're not willing to do that, you're not a serious player in the game. Yeah. I mean, you, you could see this. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, CJ. No, that's okay. I just wanted to jump in there on the on the Andrew Isker show. Uh, <laughs> um, no, th this is kind of how Carl Schmitt defined liberalism as the negation of, of, of uh, the political, the negation of power. Anything that wants to depoliticize something that has already been political, anyone that wants to deny that some aspect of, of society's confrontations are political uh, is engaging in, 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 a, in a, uh, an example of liberalism. And that's kind of how he defined it. And so all of these I've realized now, just like, you know, you know, Pete has and, and Andrew, I know you're the same that, you know, are the entire people are by the regime they're kind of kept from doing anything that could contradict the regime by having these liberal or even libertarian instincts about like depoliticization like the denial of the use of power is the meaning of liberalism and anywhere you see people saying well we shouldn't politicize that it's already been politicized like yeah. like like people yeah. who say like ford should just focus on selling trucks and not you know promoting gay rights or whatever it's like um you, you can't wish that world into existence. Depolitization comes about by cultural hegemony over hundreds of years. What we're seeing is the politicization. You have no choice but to engage in it. Everything is political. That's the world we live in now. Well, yeah. And even if there is a little bit of a deviation uh, for a time or a strong deviation for a time, um, we saw that in a certain European country after World War, II, after World War I, um, their culture was turned upside down. Mm -hmm. And it took hold so much that when it was reversed, it that chaos ensued. And, you know, the, the, you know, it's just once you lose control, once you lose order, it's, it's, it's very hard to get it back, mostly because the reason you've lost order is because somebody's um, entered the enter the game and created chaos and they're benefiting off that chaos. And yes. as long as that chaos, as long as that chaos continues, they're benefiting. When you try and take that away, they fight and they usually do it by increasing the chaos. Mm -hmm. So getting back to order, once you have chaos, that's why when I look at the, um, the national, the national po uh, political scene in the United States, I immediately go, the, to fix Washington, D.C. is going to take a very long time. Yeah. But to fix your local town where of 1,500, where most of you go to church together, you can fix that. That yeah. can be fixed because you have people of like mind and you have 1,500 people as a, you know, you're only 10 times the Dunbar number as opposed to, you know, what's 330 million? <laughs> you know? <laughs> No, exactly. Bait. I don't know if you've seen. You you probably haven't been in that scene too much, Pete. But if you've seen like the debates over Christian nationalism, things like this within well, I've just, the church. John um, Harris asked me to come on his yeah. podcast about a month ago, so I've really only been seeing it for about a month. Um, okay. More so, um, I've been really close to. I'm sure you know about everything with the Missouri Synod, uh, yes. Synod and Ryan Turnipseed. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I'm close to Ryan. We're both part of the old glory club. So, yeah, yeah I've, right. I've been right up, in, right up in all that. And that doesn't surprise me at all as somebody who, you know, 
one time collected a paycheck from the Southern Baptist Convention yeah. and watched them fall over, yeah. you know. I mean, I was working for them when Adrian Rogers was president. Oh, man. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's the throwback. That's only only like Gen Xers will. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, like, uh, but, I mean, so much of the, the debate has been, well, I, even like Desiring God uh, here put out a thing. I don't know if you saw that today, CJ, uh, about how, oh, you can't, you can't, you know, push Christianity through force is basically the the point. It's like, no, you, you can't bring, you know, human beings to, you know, saving faith through force. Uh, but you absolutely can create the cultural conditions where, where that could flourish. Um, mm-hmm. And, and so that, that's, that's a point that, I mean, that's, that's been this huge debate is like, Oh, you want to, you want to bring back the crusades and you want to bring back Christian yes. force and you want to have the Spanish Inquisition. Inquisition. Yeah. Inquisition. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it's like well, um, actually, kind of, um, I kind of do, uh, but not in the way you think. I'm not yeah. going to put a gun to someone's head. Believe in Jesus or else, right? But I mean, I, I look back um, to you know, like Anglo-Saxon history. You look at the King Alfred, and he's fighting. You know, he's fighting the Danes, and in the in warfare at that time, you you kill, you capture the the enemy king and his his nobles and his men, and you could do whatever you want with them. You could kill them, and he offered him. Uh, all right, I, I have fully within my rights to kill you now to King Guthrum. And he says, or you could get baptized and sign this peace treaty and, and leave and never come back. And he did. And he kept his vow and he never came back and he, he lived out as a Christian and his, and his men all became Christians. And, and it's like, am I going to see Guthrum in heaven someday? Right. I, I think so. And it's it's because King Alfred like held a gun to his head, uh, so to speak, and said, you need to become a Christian or else. Um, and, and much of the evangelization of Europe uh, happens in, in, along similar lines. Um, I mean, you look at Charlemagne uh, in his wars with, uh, with uh, the Germans uh, the same way, went and destroyed all of their shrines and their idols and, and said, this is, this is Christian territory now. Um, and so like, that's, that's what's happened throughout history. And it's, and it's a, an understanding of the realities of, of how politics and culture actually work that things are done through force and that we had this naive view around Obergefell where it's like, Oh, if we just persuade people of, of the Christian moral framework regarding, you know, these things uh, that's, that's going to be enough. That'll work. And it's just totally and utterly naive, but it's, that's, that is, that's something that I think Christians like our age are beginning to understand better that no, it's not that way. It's not that way that the, the world is, as it's always been. And uh, we should pursue different strategies. So, um, yeah, I, I I do want to talk about the LCMS and, and Ryan Turnipseed because apparently I didn't know this. Uh, they put him under some kind of discipline now. Um, is that is that right? Yeah. Um, I th- I'd like to have Ryan on at some point to you know just be to great. talk about these things because um, that that has been troubling and disturbing uh, just to, to witness from afar. And and you see these um, you know boomer and and spiritual boomer pastors in the LCMS who um, are, are, you know, loudly counter signaling the Nazis and the LCMS and all the evil racists and all of this. And it's like, at the same time, you have a culture where it's totally mainstream for uh, people to think that little children can have their, their testicles and penis removed, right? Like that's, that's the insanity that's taking place. And it is, has the full force of, of the state and of, of the, the institutions that, that govern our society. That's that's not the enemy. We don't need to fight those people. We need to fight this tiny little group of people on Twitter that that say mean things. Um, it's 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 totally insane. But that's that's the way our institutions are. But you you bring up like okay, you've got your small town and your church and things like that. But the the issue um, is that church is probably part of a denomination, and the denomination is is hopelessly uh, cucked. It's full of guys just like that that. Uh, want to to signal against the evil racists all day long on online and in and in their denominational meetings and everything else. Um, and meanwhile, we're we're being run over roughshod culturally, and and pastors are terrified to even speak about these things. So, how would you you know how do you approach it in, in those ways? Do you just tell your your church and your 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 elders, hey, we need to go independent so we can actually um, we can actually fight effectively or, or, or what do you say in, in, in that kind of situation? Like how, how should we approach these things on, on a local level? Cause I, I agree like localism is, is, is the way forward for sure. Well, I mean, I think if you are a small enough church and you're not making waves, you can pretty much 
keep st- you can stay within a denomination and still benefit from yeah. um, any kind of fi- any financial benefit or anything. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was in a church where this was before the SBC had their big Calvinist wars, uh-huh. you know, and this was this this preceded it by 12 years and okay. it was already starting. It, wow. it, it had already started at that point and we just shut up you know we just we didn't we're like we're not going to fight we're just going to preach uh, keep preaching the gospel we're not we're not going to ignore romans 9 and you know we're that's it i think that you can i think you know especially where i live a church even if the the SBC is saying, no, you have, you know, critical race theory is, you know, and it just seems so cucked at this point. Mm-hmm. But I think you, the, the church I've been going to here, that's a Baptist church is a 1689 Baptist church. They're still part of the Southern Baptist convention and mm-hmm. they just ignore it. Yeah. I mean, they just, yeah, they just keep going and they're growing yeah. and yeah. they're growing. Yeah. They, they're having, they're moving locations. Yeah. Now they had to get another location. So. Is that, is that in Montgomery or is that? It's in Auburn. Oh, it's an Auburn. Yeah. Okay. So, well, maybe yeah. maybe the SBC isn't the best uh, example necessarily, be, only because like, I mean we're not going to PC USA has been cucked for a long. Oh time. my goodness! Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I, I just in terms of like the the way their polity is set up, it's 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 fairly independent. Like each SBC church kind of is its own independent congregational entity, and it's a uh, you know they don't they don't even call themselves a denomination because it's it's such a loose arrangement. Right. Um, so, I mean, it, it'll, it can certainly allow for that. That's, that's really good. But if you're in a, you know, if you're in like the PCA, for yeah, example, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, you are, you're governed pretty strictly or, or the LCMS, like their, their pastors can't even, you know, publicly disagree with anything their leadership does. Like they're, they're just simply not allowed to. Oh, they, um, they, <laughs> they, they must not know a couple of the LCMS pastors. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, yeah, they're, they, some of those guys could get away with, with, with certain things, but uh, apparently like that's their doctrine. It's like, you just can't, you, you can't disagree with anything that, that president Harrison says. Um, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's insane, but um, that's, that's been my thing is like, you know, can you take over these institutions? Is it even possible? Um, I, I, I hope so. I mean, I have, I have so many friends that are fighting in the SBC and the PCA that, that would like to, uh, would like to, to fight back and be able to say like, like, he, like the PCA this week at their general assembly, they had an overture where it's like, we want our pastors to fight back against transgenderism. Right. And just preach about it from the pulpit and, and, and condemn it and, and have and and admonish the civil magistrates to, you know, to pass laws to, to fight it and protect children and so forth. Um, and there was a huge fight over that. I mean, all these people that said, oh, oh the spirituality of the church, we can't touch that. You know, it's, uh, well, it's I mean, why uh, I, my question would be, why hasn't this already been happening? Yeah. In a wide scale. And why is this being debated? I know. I know. Yeah. It's, you, think but, DJ, you think D. James Kennedy would have. Oh my goodness! Or I mean, R.C. Sproul or or any. any I mean, of I, mean I, t- I had I had class with R.C. Sproul. He was my favorite, you know, my favorite yeah. professor. Yeah. And um, yeah, I talked to Dr. Kennedy a bunch. And um, yeah, these people these aren't weren't people who were going to shut up about trans, uh, no. you know, th- this trans thing. I mean, they weren't shutting up. I mean, they, they were they would attack PBS for yeah. like for like two for taking two hundred dollars and. Um, you know, using it for like someone was going getting deep tissue rubs using using PBS funds. They, <laughs> they, they, they didn't care. They would yeah. just they would go off. I mean, I think that you know people like Dr. Kennedy and and Dr. Sproul and um, yeah, they're just. I mean, that's a. I mean, unfortunately, they're a different breed. Yeah. Yeah, and they, that 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 generation has has uh, has passed on. You know, and and we're left with. We're left with people that are are just you know, sycophantic and hirelings and want um, and want the adoration and applause of the world in leadership and and so you know that the challenge is it, I, I think you know largely changing the mindset of of as many Christian leaders as possible um, and, and along these lines like I mean so much of of liberalism and the the ideas of liberalism are are so deep in their bones. That it, it, like the moralistic views of liberalism are, are, are so um, internalized by these men that they 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 cannot understand like even even just like the issue of women pastors and feminism and things like this, 
they can't argue against it. They struggle to to look at the Bible and see how patriarchal the Bible just is. That it's it's within this the, the reality of the created order that's just baked into the cake. And they they balk at it, they they get uncomfortable, they get nervous talking about it. And and all of that is just is just liberalism is is deep in their heart. They they believe it. They believe all the stuff. Um, everything er, everything's been perverted and in well, I won't even say perverted. I would say inverted. Yeah. Um, yeah. The idea of justice. Yeah. The idea of justice to me is um, living an upright life before God, and when I fail, leaning upon Jesus Christ. Okay. Yeah. That seems really simple. Yeah. But justice isn't like that anymore. When you go online. Uh, you know, I, I was watching people this morning on Twitter arguing for justice and yeah. justice now is equality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and as, as far as I know, nowhere in the Bible does it say people are equal uh, on, to the contrary. Um, yeah. You know, I'm one of those people who you know, really studied the Tower of Babel story and read. Maybe I read a lot more into it than I, than I thought I was supposed <laughs> to. But, you know, it's why we have nations. It's why we have different cultures. It's why, mm -hmm. cult, why when you have a multicultural society, things don't work. Because not only is do you have different people with different values, it goes against God. And you, and also um, the idea that people are all equal. I mean, it's obviously not true. I mean, when no. he split those nations, when those nation, when those peoples were split there, they didn't go off and live equal lives. Mm -hmm. They didn't go and, and live in the same way. They weren't prospering in the same way. There's winners and losers. And I mean, that's not really the most biblical way of putting it, but it is a way of putting it that people can, you know, hopefully understand. It's just that okay. is when you when you look at scripture you are not going to have equal outcomes. And no. all Christ says about that is, you know, you know, the eye of a needle. And what really what that has to do is it has to do with what the intent of your heart is. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, he says, you know, the poor will always be with you. You, you will, um, you will have inequalities in society because, you know, God created people differently, right? Uh, different people have different abilities and skills and, and and that is like arch heresy to the you know modernist liberal egalitarian. Like they they truly do believe that every human being is a blank slate, and some outside force has caused people to not be equal. Otherwise, they they're all totally equal, and every outcome should be the same. Like that is that's fundamental to how these people believe, and that's 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 taken been taken up in all of our institutions. Like all of the people in charge of our churches of conservative churches that say, Oh, we believe the Bible hundred um, percent. I mean, it, 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 think about it. it. Libertarianism, libertarianism, which teaches, you know, Hey, we're, you know, we're just going to try and level the playing field as much as possible for opportunity. Yeah. And then when yeah. opportunity doesn't, when, you know, and, they want to make the argument, well, if the, if the state just wasn't there, then people could get, you know, my life would be so much better if the state wasn't there. I mean, there, well, what, well, first of all, what is better? Are you talking monetary? Are you talking your mental health? Are you talking your spirituality? Are you talking um, you just your disposition, your constitution? What are we talking about here? Yeah. Um, you can have, there are people living right now, even with this insane regime, Making the excuse that you're like, you know, I've never, I, I've never once said like, um, oh, the reason I, you know, the reason I couldn't afford this is because of the government because yeah. they take too much money, but just go make more money. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, and then you'll have libertarians go, oh, so you can pay more taxes for the war in Yemen. And it's like, well, okay, you can make that, you can make that argument until you realize that even if they weren't collecting taxes, they just print the money for that. They yeah, know this and they know this, but yeah. they're automatically they've been they've been so steeped and so it, progressivism has penetrated them so much that they have to go run towards social justice arguments, even when they're talking about things like economics or yeah. and, and and they want to say, oh, well, you know, I'm not a left winger. I mean, I, I, you sure about I, that? I, I mean, <laughs> I don't, I'm, I don't, you know, that's what is left and right anymore is, is kind of up for debate as well, you know, because con Inc is con is con Inc right wing is, is the daily, <laughs> is the daily wire right wing. 
No. <laughs> no I mean, oh, okay. <laughs> no, what is, you know, what is? And yeah, I mean, I just, it, it's amazing because people want to say, all we need to do is do this. If we do this, if we get rid of the Federal Reserve, it, it's going to stop. If we adopt Bitcoin, it's going to, yeah. You're going yeah. to have degeneracy. You are going yeah. to have if people get you know if people get richer without mm-hmm. an imp- improvement in the culture, degeneracy is going to is going to be worse than it is now. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, it's mm-hmm. just gasoline on the fire. I mean that, and that's I mean that's one of the problems with you know this a uh, liberal. Um, you know, the, the, the liberal post-war society that we have, I mean, just regardless of ideology is there's fantastic amounts of wealth that are being produced that allow for the degeneracy we have. I mean, look, I mean, t- like looking at, I mean, we talked about Uganda a couple episodes ago and the, the law that they passed there. I mean, one reason they passed that law is because, you know, if you, if you get HIV there, that's a death sentence, you're going to die. They, they don't have 20 K to give, you know, gay men prep um to to keep them alive every every year like that's how much prep costs you know in in real terms um they don't have that and so they can't afford the degeneracy like it gives us a much longer leash all the wealth that we have in this country well they Um, also tell people that if you if you have hiv and you have sex with a virgin the hiv will go away yeah yeah (laughs) that's one of the reasons for the ugandan law yeah, the people was, believe that. It yeah. was to stop yeah. underage rape. Yeah. And p- people, when you see people, you know, it's like the people who still, still, after everything they know, talk about Kyle Rittenhouse. And they're like, Kyle Ritten, yeah. you know, he was a monster. He was a, you know, it's like. He shot black people and he went out to hunt them, you know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I had a post that went like, it was just a comment. That like I had almost five thousand likes on, and I said um, somebody was talking about how Kyle Rittenhouse was, you know, he the first person he killed was, uh, you know, he sought him out, and the guy was minding his own business, and I was yeah. just, like, dude, he killed a pedophile. The only reason you're mad is because that could have been you. Yeah. <laughs> 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 It's true though. Like they, I mean, people believe these like fictitious made up things and they just, they, 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 because they want to believe this stuff, you know, it's, it's a hundred percent, you know, the way that it is. And so, yeah, I, I look at, you know, I mean, just the topic of restoring order and, and, you know, what that looks like. Oh, and shouldn't um, we be importing those Nigerians here because they're so poor, you know, the you ones that believe yeah. that if you rape virgins, yeah. it's going to get rid of the, I mean, it, it, <laughs> Isn't that, I mean, that's enriching yeah. to our culture, right? Yeah. 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 That's diversity, man. Like yeah. that's what we should have. <laughs> well, we have so much more strength yes. if, they, if we import them here. Of course. Absolutely. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. That's, that's, that's exactly it. Like uh, CJ, you, did you have something you wanted to ask? Uh, I didn't want to step on you. Cause I, uh, <laughs> everyone's like, let CJ talk more. And I'm like, yes, he's smarter. Like talk about inequality. Like CJ smarter than me. I want him to talk. I, about I, well, I don't have any, no, this is Pete's time. I didn't have any other comment on that. Although I did try to sneak in a snide comment about Ted Cruz there, but <laughs> I, I missed the opportunity. So there it is. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, Pete, I, I think, um, you know, you know, as we talk about, um, restoring order and, 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 and what that looks like, I, I, th- I think so much of it is, ultimately a spiritual battle. And I don't, you know, I, I don't mean that in the, um, the boomer sense. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, then the very Crystals true, and, like, yeah. <laughs> and uh, sage or even sage. the Christian boomer sense. It's like, Oh, if we'll just, if we just, you know, uh, pray a little bit harder or things like that, we should be praying obviously, of course, but they, they just, they, they, they view it in this totally disconnected ethereal world that is no, in no way connected to, to, physical reality um, I, I remember when like when when trump was trying to um i think he was in like december right so it was like right before it was like in between november and january 6 or whatever and the church down the street was having like this big like fundraise prayer barbecue thing for trump like because they thought it was like a spe- <laughs> that, and it's like like that's that's the version of spiritual spirituality that that you get you know so yeah. like obviously you don't mean that but like these are the same people that are sending their like their kids to public school and like you know like 
they just have no conception of where the battles are and they have zero like interest in like the political except for as it relates to like these meaningless electoral headlines you know and it's yeah, yeah. well yeah. yeah i i said that one of the best one of the best things and one of the worst things that happened to this country was trump in that mm-hmm. it got a whole bunch of people who really weren't political before Mm-hmm. interested in politics but mm-hmm. it got a whole bunch of people who really weren't political before and have no understanding of how politics works political yeah and their mm-hmm. expect and the and trump fed off their expectations their mm-hmm. expectations were that he could walk in there and he could turn you know he could you know flip the table and fix everything back to exactly how they wanted it yeah mm-hmm. and when it didn't happen, well, I mean, well, and immediately the the whole Q thing. I mean, what a great psyop that. I mean, uh, I I couldn't have come up with that psyop on my own. Pete, have Where, you have you talked to anyone about that? What Q on your show? Yeah. No, never. Oh, I'm really no. interested to know who came like who came up with that. I mean, the purpose of it, yeah. the the yeah. purpose of it was to absorb anger and and attention and and all that. But yeah. it's it was fascinating. Like who came? Like I don't know where it came from. It's amazing well, it's, to me. Yeah, it's. One of those things, it, it was perfect because it let people say, you don't have to do anything. There's a hero coming. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just yeah. Trust, the plan. trust the plan, man. Yeah. And then you just back off. They back off and they're just trusting the plan. I There are people who, st- there are people, you will, if you look, you will find people who are still saying, you know, actually yeah. Trump is still president. Still president. It's it's fake all, White House. You know, I mean, yeah. It's like, okay. And you, how much you want to bet right now if he does get reelected, whether how fast Q, the Q phenomenon becomes popular again? Oh, instantly. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's just, I mean, yeah. and it was, you know, some of us talk about like a Red Caesar, Protestant Franco. Mm-hmm. I'd rather have a Protestant Mussolini. Um, <laughs> but, but the, you yeah, know, because he, he was just, just the hairstyle or, or uh... he's just a badass. He would just <laughs> he'd walk up to people. He, he was the kind of dude who, you know, he'd kick your, he'd kick people's butt in the street. You know, he'd just be getting in fist fights and just stomping on people. You know, and I, just, I want a Protestant Saddam Hussein for the, just oh, that'd the be awesome. Uh... Uh, rest, rest in peace, Iron Sheik. Uh, but the, um, but no, it's, it's like you're, we talk about that and that could be, see, there's, what we're saying is we want that, that we think yeah. maybe that is possibly inevitable, but we're not saying, oh, we know for a fact, look at this picture. It's a, this picture is from a window on air force one. Tr- yeah. You know, yeah. Q, Q is right in the white house. He's yeah. right there with Trump and he's coming to save you. Yeah. Did look at the timestamp on this 4chan post. Like it's, it's for real, man. You know? Yeah. 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 Did he come and save you? I mean, look, yeah. you're talking about, what has escalated since Trump got out of office? You know, and yeah, I will say this, and you know, I've talked to people who, you know, probably wouldn't want to admit that they were actually talking to me in public, but um, they admit that if Trump was still president, there's no way um, um, Putin would have went into Ukraine. Yeah, there's no way. That's yeah. why he needed to get out of there. I mean, the whole the whole purpose of that thing. Of to me of the fortification was this Ukraine thing, yeah. And they needed they needed Ukraine for something. I have my opinions on what that is. Like I said, I don't want to get your show kicked off of YouTube, so I won't go into that. But you know, <laughs> wait, I want to hear though. How do we? How, we're, on, how do we... we're on Gab too, so if this, you know, we... I want to. Well, I, know... yeah. I know there's a lot of boomer cons on Gab, and they might not like my my Let's, theory either. That's okay. Who cares? Uh, Let's do it. Uh, uh, All right. No, I think I, I mean, and this isn't a. I've heard other people talking about this, and it's funny because it, it's like a whole bunch of us started talking about it at the same time, but we didn't talk. It, it was like it, it just k- k- flew out of the air. Mm-hmm. And they're they're sick of Israel. They don't want to live there anymore. They don't. They want a new land, mm-hmm. and they're going to. They're going to. Cl- they want to clean out Ukraine so that Ukraine. That I mean the breadbasket of Europe. Yeah. Can become the new Israel. That's what they. Wait, I, I don't. Um... I, I heard. I actually, a friend of mine at church or uh, uh, told me this theory. He's like, I, I, I'm like, I poo pooed it. Actually, I thought, I don't, I don't know. I think they, you know, but, but then I thought, well, when you know about it's more. When you know the history of uh, of that of that, they're all from there. Ukraine, yeah, it's yeah. like 
that is their it's like me- mecca to them i mean yeah. it's what um what what about the current state of Israel makes it unattractive to them? It's just it's just the ongoing conflict with the Islamic nations. Is that what it is? Yeah, I th- and it's just getting too small. I think they want to in they, they want to increase the amount of uh, you know the more people they have, the more they have. But also, yeah. where are they at? What can they grow? What can they? Yeah, I mean, it's just yeah. and there's this historic thing to it. You know, I, I'm fully convinced that people like Victoria Newland, Victoria Newland is interested in Ukraine from pogroms that happened in the 15th yeah. century yeah they're all thinking about they're all thinking like there there are deep ethnic um you know animosities that that drive this stuff there's that like christia freeland in yeah. canada as well um all of these people are like they have this like laser focus on ukraine they always have um and it's it's for these this is this is that this is the soil that they're they're connected to and they always want to return to yeah. So that's that's totally plausible. I, I, yeah, I poo-pooed the idea when he told it to me last night. I'm like, I don't know. I don't. Uh, I I, th- I slept on it, thought about it. And I'm like, I think that's it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I, uh, that's it. I can't think. It, well, they basically set up a war where Christians are killing each other. Yeah, yeah. They're using and they're using like the very far right, like domestic enemies that they have mm-hmm. of like the Azov Battalion uh, as cannon fodder. Yeah. You know, uh, and so it's like, oh, that's, that's perfect for for if this is their goal, like they're, they're wiping those people out and, and they're wiping out, you know, the male population of, of Ukraine. Um, I mean, right now, you know, there was that video like last week of this column of tanks that got taken out by, I mean, expensive, like leopard tanks. Right. Uh, And it's a column, like they're arranging a column on the battle space, which is insane. They, they, that's not how anybody, you know, who's been to tank school, like that's not how you drive armor in, in the battlefield. It's like right in a straight line where they, the attack helicopters can get you and it's like yeah they'll probably be driven by 14 year olds um or like 65 year old men like they don't have they don't have any men left well like, just that, that's part of the it. Vid- they had a video of tanks firing upon each uh, upon yeah. themselves yeah, yeah. And, it's, and and i'm and, and you know immediately i'm like oh that must be the reddit 41 percent battalion but um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but the yeah it's the Ukraine army, I mean, with the with the exception of the of the Azov battalion, you know, the the best thing, the best move Putin did is, you know, he's not sending. Do you know how many ethnic Russians he's actually sent in there to fight? Very it's a very small amount. He sent in v- Wagner and he sent in Chechens. Yeah. And he sent the Chechens in first, and there are some of the scariest SOBs on yeah. the planet. And I don't know if you saw videos. Um, Ryan Dawson was sharing videos with me early on because you could only see them on VK. And it was like these ethnic Russians in Donbass who were being attacked by Azov. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, um, Chechen, uh, Chechen troops would show up, fight them off. And you had ethnic Russians running up and hugging Chechens. And you're going, <laughs> what is going on? Strange bedfellows. Anyone, who, no, anyone no. who knows Russian politics in no. yeah. you know, Eurasian politics, you're like, oh, there's something really, you know. And that's what I pretty much knew. I'm like, well, you know, I knew the whole history of the um, the color revolution. So oh yeah. Knowing Scott Horton and um, anyone who's ever seen Oliver Stone's uh, Ukraine on Fire, which is, I mean, Oliver Stone's, uh, you could dismiss him on so much, but man, he gets foreign policy. Yeah. Right, a lot, and Ukraine on fire. I love that so much, and I thought it was going to disappear. I found a copy of it and put it on my Odyssey channel just so that yeah. it would, you know, I'd always <laughs> get a copy of it and everything because that just, I mean, it's showing you snipers. It's yeah. showing you see it. It's see them. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's insane. Yeah, yeah and, and then people buy this. I remember like a year ago arguing with like my Trump loving friends, saying like, "Look, it's not, it's not what you think it is." Like Obama did a coup in Ukraine. Uh, in 2014 and Joe Biden took all their money and look what's happening. Like Putin is not this like Hitler that's going to come take over Europe. This is, this is our country's doing. And it took, I mean, it's taken a year for people like that to come around and see it. And some of it has just been because like Trump has started to counter signal the war a little bit. Um, But even he has been, um, you know, kind of tepid about it. Um, well, from 2016 to 2018, when all this stuff started coming out about when they started trying to um, do the whole Ukraine gate thing with Trump, yeah. you, 
you saw the change in the press because you can go back, you can go on archive.org and start looking at 2016 articles being written by the mainstream press in this country about Ukraine. And they're calling it like the, 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 the uh, human trafficking capital yeah. of the all world. The corruption and all of that. Yeah. Everything. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden that just, it, that changes uh, in the span of two years. And now all of a sudden there are quote unquote, Hey, they, they might be our greatest ally. Yeah. Yeah. Part two. <laughs> Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's, that's just, I mean, it's like, whatever you see media narrative shift on a dime like that, you know, that major funny business is afoot. Like, that's why, that's what I knew. COVID. Remember? Go, yeah. Go down, I'll be careful with that too. You know, like go down yeah. to Chinatown, Nancy a hug a Chinese down, person. Hug a Chinese person. <laughs> yeah. 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 You're, you're a racist. If you think that this thing is, is serious and going to kill you. And so I was all in on it at first. I'm like, oh man, like I was going to Sam's Club and fill up my grocery cart full of like hundreds of dollars of canned food, like in water and things, you know, buying masks and everything. People look like I'm insane. And then like March 11th, you know, when they're like national emergency, it's, it's real. We're locking down. I'm like, well, I was wrong. I got played. Uh, and you know what's crazy about, I'll just interrupt for a second. You know what's crazy about COVID cured me of, I wasn't insanely germaphobic before COVID, but I was germaphobic. You know, I'd touch stuff in public and I'd, it'd bother me until I like got something, you know, and everything. And like COVID, I was just like, I hated these people that I was around so much that I was just like, I'm like, I'm going up and licking doorknobs and stuff, you know, it's just like, screw this, you know, it's like, and now I don't even think about it anymore. Uh, COVID cured me. <laughs> no, I, I still can't get the stench of hand sanitizer out of my nostrils. Uh, I mean, it was, it was everywhere, you know. I, oh, it was awful. And I, that, that just, I, I hated it to go wash your hands all the time. It's like, dude, I'm, I would, you know, before that, I'd, you know, you'd be in the men's room with a bunch of guys and like, I'd be the only one washing my hands after using the bathroom. Be like, these sick pigs, what's wrong with them? And, and now, you know, now everyone's like, you got to wash your hands 30 seconds. And it's like, and it's like just the, 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 the mind uh, control that has happened over it just has driven me nuts. And I've been cured of it too. Um, you know, yeah. COVID cured me. <laughs> <laughs> That's maybe that'll be the title of the episode. <laughs> Look, COVID it, cured me. It cured me of my libertarianism. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. Uh, same here. It, it like whatever remaining strands were left. I'm like, no, people want to be ruled. That's the way it is. Um, it's that's done. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm running around. I'm like, well, if people want to be ruled, I'm going to rule them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or or find them rulers that, that yeah. are, going, are going to be benevolent, are if going to be good want to rulers. Be told what to do, yeah. um, either I'm going to tell them what to do or I'm going to find somebody else to tell them what to yeah. do. Somebody like people, who shares my values. People want fathers, right? That's that's the, the big thing. And I mean, going back to the you know, the spiritual sickness or the spiritual warfare or, or, or you know, not in the, the boomer sense, but in the reality is um, we're, we're in a fatherless nation in, in every sense, not just in, in the, tr- in the literal sense um, with the number of illegitimate children and so forth, but, but just, we have no, no fathers to lead us um, in, in, in anywhere in anything. Oh, I just yeah. thought of something. Go ahead. Remember when we were talking about doing this, we, we, we thought we might break into dispensationalism. Go oh yes. For a little bit. And <laughs> yes. I thought, say they did get Ukraine and they abandoned Israel. Oh man, that what would is, mess all of that up. What does that do? Yeah. yeah are they going to build the temple in Kiev? You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's Kiev, bro. It's Kiev. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. My apologies. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be Odessa actually, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to open up a restaurant right outside of David's Chicken Kiev. <laughs> <laughs> Kiev. Oh, or man. Her- or at Herod's Chicken Kiev be better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it, it's... It is, it is it is wild. Like yeah, yeah. Bringing up dispensation, you know, since we, you know, we're fifty minutes in and we haven't even gotten into it. Uh, but yeah, uh, uh, I mean, that's I mean, that's that's something that that Torb and I wrote in our book um, on on Christian nationalism. We had a whole chapter dedicated to because it, it goes into some of this stuff where like you know CJ brings up the you know we're gonna have a, a prayer breakfast fundraiser to give money to Donald Trump to fight the election stuff and uh, and like that's their spiritual warfare. Those were the guys that were most in the queue. It's oh yeah, you know, but yeah, those are the people that most needed their energy and frustration absorbed by I mean, something like that. 
I do want to say, like, I'm sympathetic to the the Q belief, the people that believed in it. Like, I'm I'm extremely sympathetic to them yeah. because they had hope. Uh, they wanted hope. Yeah, somebody sold them hope, and it wasn't anything. It wasn't us. Yeah, and, and, and yeah, and and that that's the thing is like they need. I mean, there was like real organization that happened for the first time on the right ever uh, because of that. That was that was spontaneous and real and and actual grassroots. So there's there are there are, you know benefits to the craziness of it, but. But nevertheless, um, I mean, so many of them are also like very dispensationalist and, and that plays right into the, the dispensationalist mindset of just put our hands up. It's not up to us. We just can kick our feet back and, you know, the rapture is going to happen any minute and we don't have to worry about it. Right. All the degeneracy, all the disorder, all the, de the cultural decay and destruction. Right. That's just part of the plan. They're trusting the plan. And, and and so it fits like hand in glove with that same type of spiritual view where it's like, well, we don't have to worry about it. Right. Instead of the rapture, you get, you know, the you you get the white hats coming in. Right. That's that's basically it's the same thing. And and so um, some of it is as as there's this changing of the guard in terms of like that view is dying among uh, millennials and Zoomers. I mean, it's still there. It's still there you know, in the, in the right wing uh, Twitter space even. Uh, but it's it's way less present than it than it ever has been, um, and and so I mean it gives gives me a lot of hope that um, there there are people that can return to historic, you know, Protestant and historic Christian generally uh, views of eschatology where your know, Christendom was built and it was good and it was built by people who didn't think that the world was going to end in five minutes, right? It was yeah. built by people that had a stake, they had skin in the game, and they cared about their people, they oh. cared about their well, families, all of this. Well, there's also the people who wrote the Bible. I mean, the the apostles mm -hmm. were expecting Jesus to come back imminently. Yeah. If yeah. you know your Greek, that? if you yeah. know your Greek and you look at those verses, mm -hmm. they were expecting him to come back imminently. Now, yes. for, forget it, putting aside the fact that that raises a, an insane amount of questions. Mm -hmm. um, what makes you think? who doesn't have that, uh, let's admit that they have, they had, the, there was a different version of the Holy Spirit that they had than we had, than we have right now. It was okay. poured out more potently, at least. Yeah. 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 So what makes us think that we have the answer to when Jesus is coming back, when these people who actually wrote scripture were like, well, Jesus is coming back anytime. Well, that's, that's why I'm, I mean, you know, I don't know where CJ is at on the question of, you know, Matthew 24 or just the, you know, and all of that. I, I mean, I take a preterist view, hardcore on it, yeah, me that, too. Yeah. that, uh, that they weren't wrong, that he did come back in the same way that God appeared to, in Israel in, um, you know, in, in what, like 583 BC to destroy the temple the first time. Uh, that's the same kind of appearance that, that he came at the head of the Roman army and destroyed Jerusalem and, and ended the old covenant and freed them from uh, the persecutors, which was Israel. Um, and I think that's, I mean, you read the new Testament, it, not in this dispensationalist way. And you see that the bad guy in the new Testament was never Rome ever. It was not actually the Romans got like Paul out of the jams, you know, like they're the ones that saved the day for Paul all the time. And the apostles, it was, it was Israel. It was uh, the Pharisees, the, yeah. Pharisees, the, yeah. Yeah, the, the leaders yep. of the synagogues, all of, all of that. Like, that's that's who the enemy was. That's who was fighting them. And mm -hmm. and Jesus came and vindicated people. Even the, you know, it, it, it's the first time when I, I heard, like, this preterist view where, like, the unforgivable sin actually made sense. Somebody gave me a cogent, you know, explanation where it's like, blasphemy against the Son, that'll be forgiven. But blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, that will not be forgiven. It's like, oh, did I do that? I hope I didn't blaspheme the Spirit because that's not going to be forgiven. And everybody's worried about that verse. It's like, no, it's that Israel blasphemed the son and they killed him and they're forgiven for that. And, and all sorts of Jews were saved at Pentecost and throughout the ministry of the, you know, the apostles and the early church for the first 40 years. But they were given 40 years to repent and Israel corporately did not. So Jesus came and he came in judgment against them. And it's like, whoa, that makes sense. Right. Yep. And because otherwise all the liberal scholars are right. Right. Otherwise, all the liberal scholars are like, well, those stupid apostles, they didn't know what they were talking about. They thought Jesus was going to come back any minute. They were clearly wrong. And 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 the, the dispensationalist almost begrudgingly agrees with the liberals like, oh, you know, 
thousand years is a day, a day is a thousand years. And so they were right still kind of, and it's like, no, no, they, no, they weren't. Um, and, and so that, I mean, those kind of things, like th those ideas were basically illegal in Christianity for the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. And um, now because of the internet, really, um, they're starting to come out. Like I'm, um, like I'm teaching on, on revelation right now in, in, in my church, you know, I have a Peter Lightheart's, you know, commentary right here next in my desk. And it's, and it's amazing to, to go through this and, and see that this is all about the first century. Like this is all about the conflict that the church was having. And, and so uh, in the, in the bigger picture, like these ideas are starting to, to gain currency in evangelicalism. People are starting to understand them better. And, and the result is, people are much more equipped to fight these battles. So like you talk about the spiritual dimension, the spiritual warfare that's taking place. Well, Satan wants the church to think that we don't have to do anything. We can just give up and give the culture over to these people. Um, and, and so freeing people from that mindset it is far more practical and important than having a prayer breakfast fundraiser for Trump's reelection or, or something like that, right. like, or, or, or anything else, you know? Um, and, um, and so that, that those are the things that give me hope is like locally on the local level on, on in this kind of grassroots level and, and through the internet, um, so many more people are beginning to view alternative explanations of so many things. And some of that too is like, you know, your podcast, you know, you discuss a lot of, um, you know, revisionist history, a lot of the myths that took place over the last, you know, 20 years. I just recently listened to the episodes on the Spanish civil war. For example, like just that conflict alone, not even the one that immediately followed it, um, just that conflict alone and getting people to actually understand what took place there. And like and you saw this with with our friend, uh, friend of the show, Josh Abitoy, his tweet about a Protestant Franco and the freak out yeah. over it. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, and people beginning to like think about the question of Franco and what he was and what happened in the Spanish Civil War. So, you know, um, the Spanish the Civil War recap of that. The Spanish yeah. Civil War to me is almost more important than World War II. Yeah. Because the Spanish Civil War, well, 15 years before the Spanish Civil War, there was the Finnish Civil War when the right in Finland crushed the communist uprising there and yeah. crushed it for, you know, well, not for good, but I mean, like put yeah. them down. And you don't hear about that at all. You, that no. is written out of history. And when you hear about the Spanish Civil War, all you've ever had, all you've ever had is romanticism from the Republican side, from the anarchist side, from the libertarian, from the libertarian side. And what which you did, was, which what, was basically the Marxist side. Yeah, which is, yeah, they're all Marxists, what, whatever they wanted to call themselves. Yeah. Um, and they were real Marxists because NKVD was on the ground helping them yeah. from the Soviet yeah. Union. Um, yeah. But the one thing that the Spanish Civil War proved um, was that the West and the interests that have o were always against um, the Chancellor in Germany mm -hmm. that th they they needed to to end his life because he sent troops there and they won the war for Franco. Yeah, mm -hmm. the Reich won the war for Franco, yeah. and they saw how they they got to test their their skills on the battlefield there and their skills were the best ever yeah. so what does the united states do they have to side with the commies yeah you know who are going to cause the korean war vietnam the cold war um numerous um inspire mao where you know 50 to 100 million people yeah. are, are killed um so they have to crush this force um in order to so that they can have their well what do they what do they have 75 years later their sodomy party all yeah. over their sodomy and and um muslim rape gang party all over europe yeah yeah that's i mean that's what we have now like people need to like uh, that that's in terms of the the entire scope of the 20th century, one of the main things that I try to to talk to people about, and, you know, get them to see is that you know, you you really you have um, American liberalism is this is this ideology that is this cousin of of Soviet Bolshevism, and the people that ruled us in the middle of the 20th century, I mean, they were all communists. I mean, FDR's entire cabinet, uh, all of the, all of the people that ran everything, they were all commies. 
I mean, yeah. even the even like people are talking about like the CIA became, you know, they, they got, you know, it was Operation Paperclip and it was all fascists and all this kind of stuff. Like that's all all BS. That's not true. Uh, they were all through and through communists and they've always have been. Um, and they were they were instrumental in ending colonialism all throughout the third world um, and, and eradicating uh, what was once Europe. Um, so they people don't don't understand this. They think that we were the good guys, that we fought the bad guys when the reality is we we were the junior bad guys in this in this relationship. Like and we, the soldiers knew it. And the yeah. soldiers knew it. When the soldiers that came back from Europe, they came back, they they knew they won, but they did not come back with the same spirit that the soldiers who came back from fighting Japan did. The soldiers who came back from fighting Japan knew that they were fighting an enemy. It it makes a hell of a lot of difference if the yeah. if the enemy looks different than you. Mm -hmm. It did. They yeah. were sent to Europe to fight against people who looked like them and mm -hmm. it bothered them. Yeah. Had the same last name as me. I mean most of America at that point was was largely German. Um I mean my uh my great uncle was was shot down bombing Germany. Um, and there was, there was always, even, even with our family, it was always kind of weird. It's like, well, this is the country we came from. We're bombing them and they're, they're bad. Um, but it would be way different if it's, you're fighting the Japanese who had actually attacked our country. Um, and so like all of, all of these things, you know, people have, have this, this, uh, glossy eyed, you know, uh, well, court people, history. They could have fought, they could have yeah. fought on the side of Hitler. They could have taken Hitler as a partner and fought. And then people are like, oh, you want to just unleash, you just want to unleash Hitler? It's like, I said partner. Yeah. Okay. When you're fighting alongside, when, I mean, when you're fighting alongside somebody, you can, can you have agreements. Okay. Yeah. And considering that Hitler, up until England started World War II, mm -hmm. Hitler, all he wanted to do was be at peace with England. Constantly, mm -hmm. constantly, yeah. say, Ribbentrop, yeah. constantly, and yeah. let's let's have this. You know, let's have a peace. We're we're natural allies, yeah. And yeah. they just wouldn't have it. So when he went when he went into Poland to stop the Polish government from killing Germans, yeah. yeah. What does that sound like to you? Yeah, yeah. It sounds does that sound like something that happened like last year. Yeah, yeah. Oh, exactly. What, exactly. Do they call, what do they call Putin? Yeah. They call oh. him Hitler. Yeah. Oh, okay. I know. I know. <laughs> I know. Like when you, when you re realize that all of these things aren't these neat little black and white court histories that, that we had, that, that the 20th century is way more complex than anyone wants to give it credit for. And that it, it was this massive European civil war against, uh, you know, against communism. Um, that that changes how how you view these things. Um, I also think I also think um, like a lot of people just talk about like ending like theories of the Enlightenment and all that stuff. But I think I don't know if America, as we understand it, could survive the crashing of like post war like views of of World War Two. I think that's kind of a founding myth for the new America is our, our our own framework of what was going on in World War Two. As the online right begins to gain speed, like my like my grandfather, like we've been talking about World War Two and stuff, and he's beginning to really see that something different happened there. And as that begins to percolate out, I don't think America in its present form is going to be able to survive that because we're based on a specific framework specifically about what happened in World War II that's completely the opposite of what really took place. Yeah, it's like yeah. Thomas 777 says, the zeitgeist of basically how this country has run since 19 since 1945 is anti-fascism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's yeah. all it is. And no matter what you want to call it, I don't care. Oh, fa fascists were left wingers. They were so I don't <laughs> It so doesn't matter. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. matter. That's a stupid. That's just an argument to uh, to get away from the big picture. The yeah. big picture is the fact that fascism. The the people after the war who wrote about fascism and how and, you know people who wrote the authoritarian personality like Theodore Adorno, um, these people who were against fascism, they could, what they called fascism was family going mm -hmm. to church. Uh -huh. um, believing in objective truth anything that anybody who go anyone who goes to churches that is exactly what the the spirit of 
of World War II, um, what was born out of World War II was a spirit of anti-fascism. And what that anti-fascism is, is um, if you if you believe too much in in, in uh, the importance of family, you have a chance of becoming a fascist. If you go to church, you have a chance of becoming a fascist. One of the things in that book, which floored me was, they said, do you, one of the questions they asked to try to figure out if somebody was a fascist, do you think people who hurt children and hurt children sexually should be punished beyond the measure of the law? Mm -hmm. I'm like, why are you asking that question? Yeah. <laughs> do you want to do this or what? what is the you know? purpose of asking that question? Yeah. I was yeah. reading I was reading an article yesterday from 1987 where it's a gay rights activist, two gay rights activists talking about how they are going to normalize homosexuality into straight America. Mm -hmm. And they actually I, I, I'm releasing the episode on Monday. We we read we read the whole letter. Comment on it. They actually bring up in there that, well, you know, we need to make sure it's not these mustachioed, you know, people with mustaches like Andrew here. Um, that, that, <laughs> sorry, Andrew. It's all right. These, hey, it, it needed to be said, you know. <laughs> the, the mustachioed muscle man gay, that's not the one we want to bring, we, we want to put to the oh, forefront. Shave now. <laughs> they, <laughs> they, they have to look oh, do we... they have to look like an everyday person. Yeah. And they certainly can't be anyone from Nambla. Yeah. Mm. And I'm like, why not? Why did you bring that? Why would you even mention Nambla in this article? Yeah. Hmm. This is 35 years ago. Yeah. What are we seeing today? The whole trans movement is to lower the age of consent so that oh. children can basically go to the doctor whenever they want and start doing it. That lowers, that's about lowering the age of consent about everything. Yeah, mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And I mean, this is and 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 this is you know fundamental. Like bringing it back to you know World War II. It's it's the um, it's our national myth. You know, it's the Aeneid for for modern you know globalist yeah. America. It's the the Odyssey for it. I mean, every every civilization has its founding myth, and that's that's what the Second World War was. And the second you start to make it murky, right? And the second right. you start to bring up facts that don't align with the court history you um, get david they, irvinged yeah yeah you get or, i mean worse is, is anybody as excited for e michael jones's new book as i am which i don't i don't know if i'm familiar with with his book which one's he he's releasing uh oh he's releasing history. a uh, well book on the narr on the narrative of the uh that thing that the, the second thing in the second world, world war Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. I heard about that. Yes, I did. Yeah. Well, I, I think yeah, I will have to read that. Um, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the um, that yeah, I think that, that I mean that's foundational to it. Is uh, we were fighting these bad guys who, who did that's their crucifixion. That's their crucifixion yeah. myth. Yeah. It is six yeah. million Jesuses. Yeah. The gas yeah. chambers are the the gas chambers of the cross. Yeah. No, I mean you you see guys they, they talk this way. Yeah, they talk this way about that thing I mean, even even the the name for it um in in the book of leviticus the ascension offering is is the word for it is ola uh that's where the word comes from is you know the it's, it's it gets translated in a lot of translations as the whole burnt sacrifice because that's what you do but it's the ola offering the ascension offering it means to go, ascend up in smoke and that's where they get the name for it is is that they're saying that this was this divine ola of 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 their people and uh, it's it is this this um you know, this this religious idea uh, that 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 undergirds everything, um, and so all of these things. Like as soon as as soon as all of it begins to become murky, and I think, like you said, the, the Spanish Civil War is is kind of the key to unlocking it because it's 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 much more limited, right? You don't introduce um, all of the other the other things from World War II. You, it's it's limited to here's a bunch of communists that are murdering priests and nuns by the thousand. And um, and destroying civilization or just unleashing criminals on an entire society to just consume and destroy everything um, versus uh, normal people that want to keep their country um, and the normal people won. And like that, that's the paradigm that if you see that, then you begin to extrapolate that to the rest of the 20th century. Um, and you realize like, yeah, um, Americans 
you know, true blue apple pie Chevrolet Americans went and fought that war. Uh, but they came back and it didn't feel like victory. I mean, you look at even even like um, George S. Patton being assassinated. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think we can say that on here. Um, you know, George S. Patton being assassinated. It's like, why did they kill him? Right. Why did why why did they want him dead? Is it because he spoke to The New York Times and Washington Post saying we need to go all the way to Moscow? We need yeah. to like we need to we need to supply all these surrendered Wehrmacht troops and lead them into battle so we can go all the way back to, to Moscow and finish you, the job. You want to hear uh, something? That's wild. why they killed him. Yeah. You want to hear something wild? I share a birthday with Patton. Oh, I was born in the same hospital he died in. Oh, oh my goodness. In Germany. Oh, oh, you were at wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that I mean, I don't wild. believe in reincarnation or anything, but you know, like, yeah, uh... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I remember when I figured that out one day because it was like I knew I I had always known I'd shared a birthday with him, and then I was like, you know, they said, oh well, they took him to Heidelberg, um, to the hospital in Heidelberg. I'm like, huh. which one? Wonder which hospital it was. And I check, and I'm like, oh, I know that hospital. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, I mean that. Like Patton, I mean, I think that's that's a figure. I mean, you, you had like the silly, you know, Bill O'Reilly book on it. Um, but uh, I, I think that's one that people should focus on um, with that war. His war it, diaries. His, his I have his war diaries. They're right there. For his yeah. war, what's his diaries? Mm -hmm. There it is. I got a hardcover version for like yeah. 10 bucks off eBay. And you, you could read it and he gives his opinions about the conflict straight out. Like he understands the deep politics that were taking place uh, during this, this war. And there's a reason why we don't have like the entire military is set up to not have George S. Patton's or, or Douglas MacArthur's ever again. Right. Yeah. Um, they it, like they have the filtering mechanism where you can never have a man like that true. ever again. <laughs> yeah, you can have a true version. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. You know, the big hair, uh, you know? <laughs> but, but yeah, that's, I mean that those, those things, but I, yeah, like, like you said, as, as the, as these myths start to dissipate as it just, I mean, some of it is just the process of time mm -hmm. that it's a further, an event that's further and further away. So it has less cachet for like a zoomer than it does, um, that it does for a boomer or, or anyone older than that. Um, and so they, they don't, they're, they're, the education system is so bad that they don't even learn anything about the court history of World War II. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, which, I grew up. In, I grew up in that myth. I mean, my parents were true boomers, for, yeah. born in forty-seven and forty-eight, respectively. Mm. I mean, so I that myth was just ingrained yeah. in me. Mm -hmm. it just, uh, and, it, and it's what makes us good people, right? Is being anti-fascist and and being against the bad people. And, um, and, and you see that working out in all of these conflicts, even the church ones that we're talking about, like you see this, you know, we talked about the LCMS and all of these things like that's, that's what they're freaking out about is that many of these guys online are starting to dispel some of the myths about um, our, the, the last hundred years of history. And you can't handle that because that undergirds everything that even in the church people believe. That is true. Um, yeah. That, that, and that brings up the good point. Like what happens, what happens if, you know, things change in Ukraine. You don't know what happens if they, if, if that's actually what's, what's going on there, what happens to the entire 20th, 20th century myth? You know, like, like the whole point was that we had created Israel and that they were going to rebuild the temple there. And that all these eschatological significant events were going to happen. But do you think, do you think shifting things to Ukraine that undermines the 20th century? Yeah. I mean, I think so. Yeah, you know, I heard they were going to terraform Israel. Did anybody ever read the first Left Behind book? Oh yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah, man. Like I, I, it's, it's. I mean, so much of it is so silly. I, I don't think they're actually going to be able to accomplish that, though. I think, I think Russia is yeah. going to win. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Oh, Russia, Russia has already won. I don't Russia understand why. I don't understand why it's not over already. It's a meat grinder right now. They're, they're just basically Russia. Russia's losing troops, but they're not losing troops like Ukraine. Every, yeah. every, it's just a meat grinder, and it is just tearing them down. And um, I forget. I think, I think Scott Horton said basically Russia's already won. Russia's already won. There's no, there, there's nothing that they can. I mean, the only way that they can they can nuke them. Yeah. But if they're going to do conventional warfare. I mean, the Russians are just too, the Russians are too good at it. And they have too much control right now. And the all of the um, Ukrainians that were good fighters are they're gone. gone. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, they're, and and it's and you know I hate it because yeah. like I said, it's white people killing white people and it's Christians killing Christians for the most part. Yeah. And it sucks. And it yeah. seems it almost seems by design 
you know, after 2001, they declared war on, on Islam and they went to Muslim countries and killed Muslims. I think that's going to happen again. I, I expect another redirect towards Muslims because they're the ones who aren't falling for this woke stuff. And this woke stuff is a war. It is if if you have your if you have your war flag being fl flown mm -hmm. in the place of the American flag at the White House and it um it places around the world in um, embassies around the world, that flag has replaced the American flag. And yeah. anyone who's against that flag, like Muslim countries, mm -hmm. if you don't if they don't fall in line. There is going to be a, they will find another reason to start invading or bombing Muslim countries again. I agree with you. I, I think that um, the, the, I think a lot of like boomer Christian dispensationalists, they don't understand the significance of traditional Islam in the world as an opposition force against the woke. They don't they can't see that at all. It's completely beyond the horizons of their own framework. But I agree with you. I think that um, like these dictators in the Middle East that are like you know, protecting and preserving traditional Islam, which is the cultural basis of their own societies, is serving a important function in opposing the woke imperialism. Yeah, no, well, that's I, that's why. I mean, I, I've seen it more recently, even in the context of the presidential campaign, where these guys are talking about Iran again. I mm -hmm. was, um, you know, I was listening to some some stuff from like ten or fifteen years ago, um, and and they're talking about, yeah, we got to oppose the the word and i'm like oh yeah they, that was a big thing you know back in like 2012 2013 um and it kind of fell off the, the radar um just because that those conflicts more or less um resolved themselves um but uh i yeah i think i saw like rfk is is tweeting about opposing iran getting a nuclear weapon and thing, things of that nature and I, I, it makes me think they're ginning that up again Right. They want to uh, they would very much I mean, partly because like Iran is aligned with Russia, too, um, yep. and, and providing them drones and, and, and war material. Um, so that that would make sense that it, they would pivot toward. And, and Iran is still this very traditional Muslim country that opposes Iran Muslim. has bailed out, bailed out Syria, uh, has bailed yep. out um, um, you know, those countries when they've been under attack. And so has Russia. Yep. So, of course, of yeah. course, I mean, so, it, it's. Yeah, that, that might be where they pivot to next, I think, because you're, you're not going to be able to fight a conventional war against um, Russia because they have nuclear weapons. Uh, and that's they have why China. Like, you can't fight. A, you can't fight a conventional war against Iran. Have you uh, ever? Well, no, with all the mountains. I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, it is it, it would be impossible. I mean, they well, yeah. it wouldn't be impossible, but they would be it, it's like Afghanistan. I mean, they would yeah. be destroyed. I mean, they they would yeah. know they were coming. They would have to do a complete air war, a complete blanketing. Mm -hmm. And I mean, yeah. you're talking about people who, you know, for for his, I mean, I know people from Iran who who grew up mm -hmm. in Iran. They're, I mean, Shiites are not Sunnis. Okay, mm -hmm. Shiites are. They may have their times when they're like, we need women to cover their heads. Okay, mm -hmm. but for the most part, they really don't crack down a lot on stuff no. like that they're not like sunnis and no. yeah i think that's i i i really think this regime like sometimes appreciates and likes the um the the, the more radical elements because you know they cause more chaos and the more and regimes that cause more chaos um well you have more there's more of an excuse to go over there yeah, more things you can do. I mean, I think they, I, I definitely could see an air war taking place over Iran, um, in the next you know three to four years for sure. I mean, can you can you imagine the celebration, um, in D.C. when when um Al Shabad, like said that they were okay, we've sided with Al Qaeda, which they really didn't. They I mean, Al Qaeda was what sending them up like a thousand bucks or something like that. I mean, it was like this ju this insane junior partnership, and it's like oh now now Al Shabad is is lined with Al Qaeda. Now we can. We can yeah. go in there and yeah. bomb the crap out of them. Yeah. It's like yeah. you know, bomb the crap out of a average IQ sixty five people. Yeah. Yeah. Just let them. They'll do it. They'll they'll whatever. <laughs> They're going to do it to themselves. Stop yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's it's so silly, but I mean, I think yeah. The, I mean, the worry I have with uh, Ukraine is the possibility of sending NATO troops in there just yeah. because Ukraine has run out of men. Um, and if they do that, that that would be insane. I mean, it would be you're opening yourself up to an entire new envelope of, of um, 
possible downsides that are like world destructive. But I, I don't I don't put that outside the realm of possibility of something they would do. I mean, I think they I think it's it absolutely possible that they would send Polish troops into Ukraine to you know fight as volunteers or something you know, along those lines. I mean, back to the Spanish Civil War parallels. Um, but uh, I do think that that you know the war machine doesn't rest or stop. Like they, I mean, we're, we're spending trillions of dollars and it's being poured in there, and it, they're constantly, always pushing for something to be happening. And so if if Ukraine the Ukraine war ends. They'll they'll employ that somewhere else. I mean, that's the whole reason for getting out of Afghanistan is I mean, ultimately is to do Ukraine. I mean, that's why that's why they got out of it. It wasn't it wasn't like they weren't able to keep a few thousand troops there indefinitely, you know, in the in the Kabul airport. Um, it, it was they, they don't want to even even that they don't want to be stretched thin so they can devote all the resources to Ukraine. Um, Did you see the tal- the clashes between Taliban and uh, Iranian forces? Yes, I did. I heard about this. Yeah, yeah. You wonder why they left behind all those uh, all those weapons, huh? Yeah, yeah. I wonder. I wonder now. Yeah, yeah. It, because now it's a bulwark against against Iran. Um, you know, that's. I mean, it's it's set up that way where you have this axis between Iran, China, and Russia, and they they uh, they they want these to be the bad guys that they're going to pe- keep putting pressure on, and and it, it'll it'll erupt into some kind of warfare at some point. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, they're, they're, they're ginning up war against China, too, with, with Taiwan and saying, oh, we're not going to defend Taiwan or maybe we will. We don't really know. Um, they want I mean, they want to introduce confusion to get the Chinese to do it, I think, um, so that they can justify war. Um, like that's that's what drives all so much of this. And and I, I think, you know, at a, at a macro level political picture, I mean, people on the right are much more savvy about these things than they were even 20 years ago, mm-hmm. um, way more savvy uh, about it. I mean, at least, at least a, a good segment of them. Um, and that, that gives me hope too, that there is, there's an actual genuine anti-war movement in opposing the regime, but they can't, they can't just get the wool pulled over their eyes as easily anymore about like, this is our country, USA all the way. Oh, we're going to war and fighting for freedom. Like people don't buy that stuff anymore, uh, anywhere near to the same degree. Um, and I mean, you saw that when, like Ron Paul at the South Carolina debate, you know, uh, counter signaled the war on terror in like 2012 and gets booed out of the building. And then uh, four years later, uh, Donald Trump goes there and says almost literally the exact same thing. And, and it's to loud applause. Yeah. You know, like uh, there's been a sea change, I think, in in uh, in views um, that people are understanding that we have an enemy regime that occupies us and they, they hate us and want us to want us dead. Um, but um yeah, do you have anything else to add, CJ? I know, I know your time is running short. You, uh, you've been podcasting away all day today. But I, I, do you have any more, any, any more questions for Pete? I, uh, we, we, I, I've had yeah. a blast here. We could have you on for four hours. You know. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I, I want to talk more about like the Spanish Civil War and stuff, but um, I'm not gonna. We're, we can't. We don't have time to get into it today. But like, just the revisionist history. I think it's it's not only happening but it's extremely important um because mm-hmm. people people like will often like instinctually think that like everything was fine and then 5 years ago all this stuff happened it's like no this this is kind of like the end of a cycle like this has kind of been built into the cake since america took over world hegemony you know and this is what's what you're seeing is like the demons being released because it's in its last throes yeah no i um yeah, it's it's what we hope. It's we hope it's coming to an end. But what we know when empires come to an end, people get hurt, mm-hmm. and that's another one of the reasons why. If we are coming to an end, you know, who knows? I mean, pe- good scholars say that Rome started falling, you know, three hundred years before it actually did. So yeah. you know, we could be here for a very long time, and I think that's another reason why I try to promote localism as much as possible. Uh, because local having allies locally, um, you know, living in a town that might have a um, a railroad head or something like that, um, is is helpful. Growing your own food, if you can, having chickens is really helpful. So, and, and I, I I keep saying on Twitter too, like the ideological consensus is faltering, and when something like that is faltering, help push it over. You know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, well, that's. I mean, the last question I think I have for you. We had uh, Charles Haywood. I think you're. You, yeah, you're. You're familiar with Charles. Uh, he's an old glory. Charles and I have. Uh, 
yeah. Charles and I, I had a chance to hang out with him last year down in down in the Florida Keys. He's a really good oh. guy. Man. Oh, he's great. And and his his opinion is that the regime has like less than a decade left, more or less. Like he thinks it's going to collapse, uh, which. I want him to be right. <laughs> you know, I want him to, about to be this right. regime or the American regime. The, the American regime. Yeah. The American okay. regime. The, the, yeah. And it's, I, you're right. I mean, I, I can see his argument. Um, mm-hmm. Certainly I, I can see where the fissures are and, and, and how it's plausible. Uh, but at the same time, I'm like, I could see this going on for another 500 years um, too. I mean, some of it uh, on Haywood's side, some of it is, you know, you have these incredibly complex systems that keep everything rolling and you don't have the people anymore to maintain them and, and operate them. Um, and that might be enough to introduce, uh, to introduce a collapse. But, uh, I mean, do, do you see, do you see how that, that could be possible? I mean, and what are the percentage chances of that? I, I, I don't th- as far as I'm concerned in the next 10 years, um, you know, my, I have a friend, um, he still still calls himself a libertarian named Tom Luongo. Um, he's been writing, um, written for LouRockwell.com for decades. He has his own he has his own thing now. Very popular, um, doing very well on Patreon, um, and his predictions have been phenomenal. Um, especially, I mean, he was nailing what was going to happen in, in Ukraine. But something that he noticed um, over the last year is that. He believes that the the European elites and the American elites are warring against each other. He says that the Federal Reserve now has basically declared war on um, the World Economic Forum, and that's why they're raising rates. That's why they went to. Um, that's why you saw. Um, I think this month. I'm not sure if it happened yet. Libor is is being eliminated. Um, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange is is no longer. Um, holding futures on the euro um it's going to go to an overnight rate thing i mean and if tom is right and he has been right on a lot of things this escalation of jacking up interest rates and interest rates and interest rates is his that pal's main purpose is to destroy the euro dollar and to, well and that's to destroy the euro dollar just basically to destroy the world economic form which it would the way to do it is to you know, eliminate the power of the of the euro. And if that happens, if he's able to do this, if that's exa- if that's actually what he's doing at the time, then this could go on for a long time. I, I don't think that the uh, yeah, that, you know, Wall Street, Wall Street does not like the World Economic Forum. Wall Street doesn't like the idea. Wall Street doesn't like the idea of central bank digital currency. It goes directly against everything that they stand for. So there's there's a war going on right now. Um, I've done episodes with Tom. We've had Tom on the Old Glory Club. Um, mm-hmm. I had him on recently. He'd be great for your show to have on to talk about this. And I, um, this is, this I mean, it's, it, it's really interesting. When he starts breaking it down and you start seeing it and you're like, wait a minute, hold on. So this article you wrote two months ago came true. This article you wrote six months ago came true. Everything you said in there came true. Um, if if he's right, it's I'm not going to say it'll save the dollar forever because nothing could do that. But it could save the dollar for a long time. And it will be not because Jerome Powell and his cronies love us, but because it will benefit them, it will benefit oh, yeah. us as well. Yeah. So, Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's a good. All right, guys. I uh, I don't know if it's an optimistic point, but yeah, CJ, uh, we got to wrap up. You got to get going. I got. I have. Mm-hmm. I have a tea time. I have to get to as well here. So. Uh, and uh, Pete has to. Pete has to go rug shopping. So I, I got. I got to go look at a carpet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Let Let me. Uh, let, let's end with uh, just any anything you want to plug. I mean, obviously your show, uh, your Substack, uh, things like that. But yeah, let let us know. Let our people know where to find you. Uh, the Pete Quinones show, any podcatcher, just put that in. Um, I'm on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, uh, and PeteSubStack.com. And check out the Old Glory Club. It's a bunch of us who came together to just basically start a fraternity of of um, content creators. And we have a 
we have a YouTube channel and we have a sub stack. So old glory club, we just did a stream last night, uh, talking about the legacy of, uh, and the manifesto of Ted Kaczynski. So, yeah, yeah, yes. Well, yeah, everyone check that out, please. And, and CJ, what, what do you have for us, uh, uh, this week? I haven't written anything new. Um, although I did, I did interview Tom Luongo. Lazy. <laughs> on Chron- I've been so busy. Yeah, on, on Chronicles, yeah. I actually, it, I haven't put it up yet. Um, but yeah, so you can check out the Chronicles podcast, and uh, you can always find me on Twitter. I'm always active there too. So, at who did you have on today at, for Chronicles? Did yeah, you, we had, everybody know who you. We had Doug Wilson um, and uh, Paul Gottfried. So it was a really cool combo. Oh, I can't wait. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. For me, um, I uh, I have an article that I've been saying I'm going to get out there uh, responding to criticism of Christian nationalism uh, for Gab News. That'll that'll be out pretty soon, I promise. Uh, But that but also uh, we're we're doing work on the book, the Boniface Option. It should be out um, maybe next month. Uh, The first people to find out will be on this podcast. Uh, that w- what the date was of, re- of release so we'll let you know what that date is and, and when it'll be out but uh we'll we'll get pete a free copy of the book here once it's out you know all of our guests i appreciate so that they can they can they can also shill it uh to, to everybody uh but no it's, it's gonna be really good i think i think people will really like it it'll be a handbook for aggressive christianity and a lot of the localism stuff pete is talking about is is gonna be in that book as well so um you, we'll check that out but uh that's all we have for today. Um, uh, thank you to, to Pete for joining us. And, and thank you, CJ. And thank you all for listening. Please like, subscribe, share this. Uh, uh, tell us where you disagree uh, with CJ and not me because I'm always right. Uh, but other than that, uh, everyone have a wonderful week and we will see you next time. Thank you.